How's everybody doing? Survive the weekend? If you're here, I guess you must have. If you're not here, please raise your hand, right? Everybody from Mobile Chemistry? Everybody's found the web page and everything so far? At least that has looked. Okay. Good. Any issues, technical issues or problems? Anybody awake? Working on awake? This hour of the day? Well, maybe it's time to work on a little harder, but I can relate to it. I tell you, I've been yawning all day myself, and I'm not quite sure why. I think it's this weird weather, and um, I actually have something about the weather for later that I'll give to you. So, um, Last time I talked about the molecules, the lipids that we find uh, in membranes. Today I'm going to talk about membranes. Most of what, in fact, virtually everything I'm going to say today concerns membranes. If I get far enough, I will talk um, later in the hour about the vitamins. Okay, uh, But most of what I'm going to ta be talking about will be related to membranes. So as I alluded to last time, membranes are very um, essential. Without a membrane, we don't have a boundary between what is a cell and what is not a cell. So it's important that we have that boundary. And that boundary, as I said last time, um, is a um, very interesting one. It's very good in that it allows certain things to pass through it without any problem. Um, and the, the primary ones there being oxygen coming in and carbon dioxide going out. Okay? The other two are a bit more problematic. Carbon monoxide we'll talk about later in the term when we talk about electron transport. You may have heard a little bit of this from Dr. McFadden already, but you'll hear more about it from me later in the term. Um, but water is also a problem. Water is freely permeable across the membrane, meaning it can move all by itself. Now, I'm sure most of you have had the experience when you took basic biology of working with dialysis tubing and putting, say, a protein or something in there and then letting the thing start to swell. Why does it start to swell? Why, when you put protein in a tube and then you close it off and you put it into a buffer, why does the, the tube start to swell? More solute in the tube. So osmotic pressure drives the water to come in and dilute out what's in the tube. But since what's in the tube can't get out, if you let it go long enough, the tube will actually burst. Okay? So water is trying to um, uh, basically counteract the, the effects of that solvent. Well, that's a problem for a cell. A cell has the same problem. A cell is full of protein. It's full of things that are not found outside of cells. And so water can freely move across the membrane. A cell is under continual pressure from water trying to come in. And water is coming in to a certain extent. Why don't cells burst? Well, we're going to talk about that a little bit later today. But the reason that they don't burst is because cells play some tricks with osmotic pressure. They play some tricks with osmotic pressure. And it's one of the reasons why cells need to burn ATP constantly. They need to burn ATP constantly, and we'll see why that is the case. Okay? But before I get to that, I want to say a little bit about what you see on the screen. So what you see on the screen are, uh, is, is a lipid bilayer. A lipid bilayer means, a bilayer, of course, means two layers. So we can think of this cell surface. Here's the cell sort of enclosed that we can see here. And we can see there's two layers, one layer here and one layer here. And those are shown in a little bit more detail up at the very top. On the inside of the bilayer, we see the hydrophobic tails of the fatty acid side chains that are uh, interacting with each other because, again, the hydrophobics like to associate with each other. And on the outside, or the inside, that's where water is located. So we have water in here, or we have water out, and we have water out here. And so those polar side chains like to interact with the water, and they orient themselves as you see. This orientation will actually occur spontaneously. It doesn't take the cell constructing anything. The chemistry of these things will automatically assemble, just like you see here. Okay? 
So that's one of the really cool and simple things about a lipid bilayer. It doesn't take any special construction to make it. All right. Now, there are four things, as I noted, that travel very freely across the membrane, all right, the, the lipid bilayer. Most other molecules do not, however. Most other molecules do not travel freely across that lipid bilayer. Glucose does not. Okay? In fact, virtually any other biochemical molecule that you want to pick doesn't go across that lipid bilayer very well. That means that if the cells are going to have it inside of them, they need proteins to specifically transport those specific molecules in and out. Those proteins are located on the, um, I shouldn't say on, but embedded in the lipid bilayer. So we're going to spend some time talking about those proteins and the movement of things across the lipid bilayer. That's a good deal of what I'm going to talk about today. That makes sense? Clear as mud? Nobody's woken up since I first got started? The giggles tell me that perhaps you're starting to wake up. OK. Well, um, I talked last time about fatty acids. And remember that fatty acids are a component of those glycerophospholipids and those sphingolipids that we find in the lipid bilayer. And so I talked to you and said that if we increase the unsaturation, that is, we make more double bonds, we lowered the melting temperature of the fatty acids. And similarly, we lower the melting temperature of the glycerophospholipids and the sphingolipids that contain them. So membranes, we don't usually think of as freezing and melting. But there are analogous things to that. Membranes we think of basically as being more fluid and less fluid. So a fluid is something that's sort of like a fluid. It's more like water. It's flexible and so forth. And our membranes need to be flexible. That's a very critical thing. Our membranes need to be flexible. If cells get to a temperature where the membranes are stiff and rigid, okay, then the cell will not function. Now, what that means, if we think about it, we think about all the cells that there are on the face of the Earth, your cells are really nice, right? Your cells, you're a warm-blooded animal. At least most of you are, I think. You're a warm-blooded animal. My wife has the coldest feet on the face of the earth. So there's times, <laughs> there's times I question that, right? But, but short of that, she, I think she's a warm-blooded animal. The cells in our body, for the most part, are pretty much kept at a constant temperature. Okay. They don't have extremes. Maybe the, the, the skin cells have a little bit more exposure to uh, the, the outside environment. But other than that, there's not much in the way of extremes. On the other hand, if I look at other organisms, they may have very big extremes. And they may have very different environments than what I live in. Okay? So if we think about this, we think about, well, there might be different compositions of the fatty acids in the membranes of other cells of organisms that live at different temperatures. I bring this up, and I'm coming back to nutrition again. I apologize for the non-nutritionists. But I bring this back to nutrition because when I think of fish swimming around in the ocean, anybody who's ever gone into the ocean outside of Newport and discovered what that temperature is like, it's enough to wake you up, right? And or freeze you to death, right? It's cold. It's not 98.6 degrees like we have in our body. And fish have to exist in that environment. Fish, therefore, have to have different composition of fatty acids in their membranes than we do. It's no surprise that fish, therefore, have more unsaturated fatty acids in their membranes. And guess what? Everybody knows about fish oil. Fish oil is full of polyunsaturated fats. It's not a coincidence that that occurs. Okay? So knowing something about the chemistry of the fatty acids helps us to understand something about nutrition, helps us to understand something about the extremes that life exists in. On the other end of the spectrum, there are organisms that live in temperatures of essentially boiling water. They've got the other problem. 
they've got way too hot of temperatures. And it turns out that that hot temperature is a problem for them as well. So they actually have some, and I won't go into it here, but they have some different structures that they possess that allow them to be stable at a higher temperature. Now there's wide ranges of these. So this isn't like one set temperature that a, a, a membrane can exist at. You can go swimming in the ocean, for example, your cells aren't going to freeze unless you decided you wanted to live in the ocean. Then in that case, you might have some more uh, issues associated with that. Okay, so saturated, unsaturated, very important considerations. Okay, um, when we see more unsaturation, and remember unsaturation, oh, another thing I should point out, when we look at the fatty acids that exist in our cells, almost all of them have double bonds that, are, that the ones that have double bonds, that is, almost all of the double bonds are in the cis configuration. Almost all the double bonds are in the cis configuration. We hear about trans fat and trans fatty acids. Okay? Where do those come from? Well, for the most part, trans fatty acids come from chemical modification of food. Chemical modification of food. All right? Why do we chemically modify food in this way? There's two reasons. Let's imagine that I've got a, um, an oil that I want to use to make cookies. Okay? And I am a major food distributor, and I want the cookies to be tasting good, and I want the cookies to have a longer shelf life. What food manufacturers do is they take that oil, they do what's called part, blah, partial hydrogenation, where they're adding hydrogen, that is molecular hydrogen, to the oil. That will interact with the double bonds and will convert them, at least to some extent, from being a double bond to being a single bond. So they're decreasing the saturation of those. That means that they are raising the melting temperature, so they're essentially converting them from something that's a liquid at room temperature to something that's more of a solid at room temperature. That makes them more desirable for cooking, and don't ask me why I'm not a cook, so I can't, I can't answer that question for you, but it makes it more desirable for cooking, and it turns out that they last longer. Well, there's a reason that they last longer. It turns out they're not completely saturating the fat. That is, they're not converting all of the double bonds into single bonds, only some of them. That's why they say partial hydrogenation. Okay? In partial hydrogenation, sometimes what happens is, is as a bond is converted, the bond next to it is converted from a cis to a trans configuration. That trans configuration is bad. We talk about good and bad. That's definitely on the bad side because trans fat and trans fatty acids are, in fact, linked to things like uh, inflammation of arteries and things like atherosclerosis. Trans fat, not good, okay? Now, you see on the market, and you guys are nutrition majors, many of you, you know very well what I'm going to tell you. That is, you see something that says trans fat free. That doesn't necessarily mean it's trans fat free. It means that it has less than half a gram of trans fat per serving. And if one's the serving is one-eighth of an Oreo, <laughs> right, and you eat four Oreos, you've probably gotten a fair amount of trans fat, even though it says on the label, trans fat free. Okay? How can you tell if something is truly trans fat free? Look for the words partially hydrogenated. If you see the words partially hydrogenated, it's got some trans fat in it, no matter what it says. Okay? Good to know. All right. This shows the, um, uh, the uh, gl glycerol phospholipids and sphingolipids in that membrane if they are saturated or if they are unsaturated. When we see that they're unsaturated, we see there's more disorder. And that increasing disorder means we have to cool it down to a much lower temperature to get them more ordered. That's what happens when we're freezing something. So it has to go to a lower temperature to increase the order. And that's what's why uh, the uh, unsaturation decreases the, the uh, melting temperature. OK. Butter versus margarine. Uh, saturated, monosaturated, polyunsaturated. This stuff I worry about here, coconut oil. Okay, It's really popular, and I say, why? 
Why? Okay. Look at the amount of saturated fat that's in that crap, right? Okay. Be careful. All right. Um, cholesterol. Cholesterol is something that we also find in membranes, and I mentioned last time about our, how our brain has 14% by dry weight of cholesterol. And it's there because it's found in the membranes of our brain cells. It's also found in the membranes of most cells of our body. One of the reasons our body is making cholesterol is so that it can help to stabilize membranes. Cholesterol fits into membranes very nicely. Cholesterol is a lipid. I talked about it last time. It is a lipid that is mostly nonpolar. And the only part of cholesterol that's polar is this little hydroxyl group that's at the end. So it positions itself within one section of a lipid bilayer. Remember, here's one section. The other section would be over here on the right. It positions itself kind of like this. And the effect of cholesterol is a little odd. It's a little interesting and a little odd. Okay? If we think about melting temperature, remember I said that we can think about, we think about a membrane becoming less fluid and more fluid instead of frozen and liquid, right? A membrane is, more, is less fluid, meaning more solid-like, and more fluid, meaning more liquid-like. Okay? Um, and the conversion from one form to the other, if we look at the temperature, is actually fairly narrow. Right? Well, you think, of course it's narrow. Well, that's because you're thinking of water and ice. Water converts at, at 0 degrees centigrade or 32 degrees Fahrenheit from liquid to solid. It's right at that point. It's not wide. It's at that point where that happens. When we look at a membrane, that conversion from more solid-like to less solid-like, or less liquid-like to more liquid-like, whatever, whatever you want to say with that, or more fluid-like, um, that transition is over a range of temperatures. It's not one degree. Okay? And it turns out that what cholesterol does is it widens that range. So what cholesterol may be doing is changing the properties of a membrane to make them more fluid over a wider range. Okay? It may be making them more fluid over a wider range. There are, there are likely other things that cholesterol is doing inside of our membranes as well. OK, so cholesterol is very important for membranes. Cholesterol is not all bad. As I said, we have to keep that in mind. What I want to do now, um, having talked about the um, membrane structure itself, is I want to spend some time and talk about the proteins that are in membranes. Okay? The proteins that are in membranes. There are four different kinds of proteins that are depicted on the screen here, OK? One, two, three, four. And there's actually a fifth uh, that I'll talk about that's not shown on here, all right? The first of these, number one, is very easy. And each of these has a name, by the way, OK? Each of these has a name. Number one is a very um, uh, common protein. We see a lot of it. It's called an integral membrane protein. An integral membrane protein. Okay? An integral membrane protein projects all the way through the lipid bilayer. It has one end on the outside of the cell and one end on the inside of the cell. And if we were to think about the organization of the amino acids in this protein, it wouldn't be too difficult for you to think about how they might be organized. Here's what we see. In this region of the protein right here, we see amino acids that are very hydrophobic, meaning they don't like water. And on the ends, where we see this, we have amino acids that are very hydrophilic because they're associating with water. And that's exactly what we see in, it, in these types of proteins. The second protein that's up there, number two, is not very common at all. Okay? And I, I show it to you just because, so you, so you know the name. It's called an embedded protein. It's completely embedded in the lipid bilayer. And you might look at this protein and say, well, I would expect that this guy would have completely hydrophobic amino acids, that it's interacting with the hydrophobic tails 
of this uh, membrane right here. Not very common at all. We won't, we, we, in fact, we won't encounter this protein at all. Okay. Protein number three is something we call an associated membrane protein, meaning it's not really a part of the membrane, but we see it around the membrane. So it might, for example, interact with the polar ends of the glycerophospholipids, okay? but it's not a part. It doesn't, in, it doesn't enter into the protein at all. An associated membrane protein, that's number three. Number four is something we call a peripheral membrane protein. Okay? Number four is a peripheral membrane protein. And a peripheral membrane protein, as you can see, sticks in half of the membrane, but it doesn't go all the way through it. This is a peripheral membrane protein. Okay? And there are numerous examples of peripheral, of associated, and of integral. Very, very few uh, embedded. Okay? Now, as I said, there's one other protein that's not shown on here, but I want to describe it to you. And that is a protein that's called anchored. An anchored membrane protein. An anchored membrane protein would look like number three, but attached to it would be a fatty acid that would have its tail sticking down into here. That's the anchor. So an anchored membrane protein, the protein part is not embedded in the membrane, but something else is, and that something else is what's anchoring it to the membrane. The something else will almost always be a fatty acid. So a protein attached to a fatty acid, the fatty acid stuck in the lipid bilayer, and that's helping to hold it to the membrane. That's what an anchored protein is. That would be the fifth one. Well, for the rest of what I'm going to talk about today, we're going to be concerned with integral membrane proteins. Because the proteins that are involved in transporting molecules across the lipid bilayer are all integral. They're all integral proteins. Gesundheit. OK. Oh, here's the anchor. I didn't realize they had an anchor on there. So there's, this is what an anchored um, would look like. Okay? It's like this guy right over here. Here's a protein. There's his tail. And there's the fatty acid anchoring it in the lipid bilayer. I forgot to put that in there. OK. All right. I like this figure because it depicts um, all of these different types of proteins and, and various components that I've talked about. And so now you can see them in the context of a cellular membrane. Okay? Here is an integral membrane protein. Here is a peripheral membrane protein. We don't see any embedded ones in here. Uh, but we do see um, various other things that are associated there. We see cholesterol and how cholesterol is scattered through the membrane there. We see some other molecules present as well. We see something called a glycolipid. And I'll talk about that later. We won't need, don't need to be worried about that too much. And we see something called an oligosaccharide. All right? So an oligosaccharide, a saccharide means sugar. An oligo means it's got a few of them. Okay? Some proteins that are embedded in membranes have this oligosaccharide attached to it. And that oligosaccharide turns out to be pretty important because that oligosaccharide that's on the surface of our cells is an identity marker. It tells the rest of the body, this is Kevin Ahern. It tells the rest of the body, this is a liver cell. It tells the rest of the body something about what's there. And if I muck with that, I may have consequences. So for example, if I were to need a lung transplant, and one of you were to donate one of your lungs to me, okay, I would have lung cells that would have your oligosaccharides on them, not my oligosaccharides on them. Okay? The difference being that my immune system, which is poised to look for foreign invaders like bacteria and a variety of things, would look at this and say, oh, invader and attack it. So when you hear about organ transplant rejection, that happens because 
you've gotten an organ from somebody who doesn't have a match to your oligosaccharide component. That's an important consideration. There's various ways of dealing with that. One of the ways is to suppress the immune system so that it's less likely to attack foreign things like that. Okay. So the oligosaccharide on the surface of a protein, in this case an integral protein, is important for identity. We also, when we look at blood cells, you're a type O, you're a type A, you're a type B, or you're a type AB, AB minus, et cetera. These pieces of information are communicated by other oligosaccharides on your blood cells. Okay? So oligosaccharides on the surface of cells are very important for various functions of identity. We'll talk about oligosaccharides later in the term, but that, I just want to start you thinking about that. Okay. Oh, one other thing about oligosaccharides. They're always, there's an always for you, on the outside of the cell. They have no function on the inside of the cell. And that makes sense because if we think about it, identity is going to happen from the outside, not from the inside. Who cares about it from the inside, right? So it's always going to be on the outside. All right. The last thing I want to show you here is a cool thing, okay? This Remember I said that we can take these glycerophospholipids and we can take these sphingolipids, and if we mix them together in water, what they will do is they will spontaneously form a lipid bilayer all by themselves. We don't have to do that. And so that's, this, that's what's depicted here. Someone has taken and purified or isolated the glycerophospholipids and the sphingolipids of a bunch of membranes. And they took those, and they poured some water on it, and they shook it up. And when they shook it up, these, lipid, these glycerophospholipids and sphingolipids spontaneously formed a lipid bilayer. And they formed a lipid bilayer that's not unlike we would see for a cell. Here's the inner part, which would correspond to the cytoplasm of the cell. And here's the outer part out here. Okay. Well, this turns out to be a very useful laboratory tool. Okay. The reason it's a useful laboratory tool is let's imagine that I've got a drug I want to give, and I want to get it into a cell, but oh my god, I can't get it into the cell because I don't have a way of getting across that lipid bilayer. Right? Well, what I could do is I could take a liposome, I, I'm sorry, I could take the glycerophospholipids and sphingolipids, add some water, and add the drug. Shake it up. And when I shake it up and this thing starts to spontaneously form, I've got an inside and an outside. By the way, this thing is called a liposome. That's what that thing is there. It's an artificial cellular-like structure that I've made, a liposome. Okay. Inside of the inside, inside of the inside, whatever that means, okay. inside of the inside is going to be contained a little bit of that drug. Everybody envision that? So a little bit of that drug is sitting right inside of here. Now it turns out that these guys, these membranes, will easily fuse with our own membranes. Well, when they fuse, the contents get dumped into the inside of our cells. So now I've just designed a delivery way to put drugs into cells that wouldn't otherwise have drugs available to them. Okay? So liposomes are used as delivery mechanisms for getting compounds into cells that wouldn't otherwise have a way of getting in. Now, there are some complications with that. I'm making it very simple for you. But the point is that they are very useful for delivering things across the lipid bilayer. Questions? OK. All right, membrane transport. Now we're talking about getting things across that membrane. We're going to talk about two main types of transport, passive transport and active transport. The first of these is passive, and passive is very easy to understand. Passive means it doesn't take any excess energy to get something across the membrane. It only takes the process of diffusion. So oxygen, for example, I said could cross the lipid bilayer and it crosses by the process of diffusion, 
because the concentration of oxygen is greater on the outside than it is on the inside, so oxygen naturally diffuses into the cell. It doesn't take any excess energy, doesn't take any transport, doesn't take anything. It diffuses in. Okay. So all it takes is what we call a concentration gradient, meaning it's higher concentration on the outside than it is on the inside. Now, that works out pretty well because, again, oxygen can move without needing any other proteins. If I tried to do the same thing with glucose, I could have a higher concentration on the outside than I would on the inside, but it wouldn't move because it can't cross the lipid bilayer by itself. Okay? So we have to have a way to facilitate the movement of other things across the lipid bilayer if we're using the process of diffusion. Making sense? Oxygen, yes. Glucose, by itself, no. Okay? All right. Carbon, di carbon dioxide is the opposite. Carbon dioxide is going to be made more inside of cells, so its diffusion is going to be outwards, right? Again, not taking any energy. It's just going to go on the basis of where the concentration takes it. Okay. Well, it turns out that there are, in fact, ways of diffusing glucose across a lipid bilayer, but it takes a protein to help that to happen. Our blood cells are full of proteins called GLUT, G-L-U-T, glucose transporters. And some of those GLUTs are very, well, they're all very interesting, but some of those are pretty cool. One of them is simply a chamber into which only glucose will pass. Only glucose, nothing else but glucose. Other sugars won't pass. Other molecules won't pass, only glucose. In our blood cells, the concentration of glucose is usually fairly low. The concentration of glucose outside of the blood cell is usually fairly high. Okay? If we have a protein that allows only glucose to move, and I've got a concentration gradient where the glucose is higher outside than inside, then glucose is going to go th through that little tunnel, that little channel, all by itself. Diffusion is going to make that happen. And this works because nothing else is allowed to go through it. If this little protein allowed other things to go through it, then we'd have problems with controlling in and out movement. But these proteins are very specific in allowing only a specific thing. There's another example of passive transport didn't take any energy to make that happen. Okay. All right. Now I want to contrast passive transport to a much more common type of transport. And by the way, there's an equation there. You may ignore that equation. How's that? Okay. All right. Uh, facilitated diffusion is just what I just described to you. It's the same as, as, as diffusion. It's the only facilitated part is that there's a specific protein that's allowing it to happen. Okay? So passive transport and facilitated diffusion, same thing. Okay. You can see out here that we've got glucose in the, the um, outside the blood is uh, about 5 millimolar, and intracellular glucose is less than 5 millimolar, so therefore there's a gradient. Glucose wants in, glucose gets in. Okay. Let's talk about active transport. What is the difference between active transport and passive transport? Active transport, first of all, requires energy besides diffusion. Okay. Second, for active transport, the reason it requires energy is because at least one molecule has to be moving from a lower concentration into a higher concentration. That's opposite of what we had before. Before, we said that diffusion will drive things from higher to lower. That's what that equation I said you didn't need to know was telling you. That 
the natural process is that things will move from higher to lower. If we want things to move from lower to higher, we have to put in energy. The analogy I like to give is pumping water. Okay? If I have a pump and I want to move the water from down here to up there, I'm going to have to put energy in, right? Because it's not going to counter gravity going on its own. Similarly, things will not counter diffusion going on their own. They will flow downhill, right? Water will flow downhill. Concentrations will flow downhill. And for a concentration, downhill means from a higher to a lower. So if I want to go from lower to higher, I have to go uphill. I have to put energy in. OK, you with me? So active transport will always have at least one molecule moving against a concentration gradient, at least one. Now I'm getting ready to show you a transport system that has two moving against a concentration gradient. That's what you see on the screen. This is one of the most important active transport systems in cells. We find it in cells uh, virtually everywhere. Bacteria cells have it, your cells have it, snake cells have it, plant cells have it, etc., etc. And they have it for a very important reason that I'll explain to you in a minute. What does this protein do? Well, it does two things. Gesundheit, you're allergic to biochemistry. You're not alone. Right? OK. It does two things. First, it grabs three atoms of sodium from inside of the cell, and it kicks them out. Second, it grabs two atoms of potassium from outside the cell, and it brings them in. In both cases, the atoms are being moved against a concentration gradient, meaning that there's a higher concentration of sodium outside than inside. So I'm moving it from low to high. And there's a higher concentration of potassium outside than inside. So I'm moving it again from low to high. How do I make that happen? Well, the way I make that happen is actually shown right here. Look at ATP. We're burning ATP to make this happen. Active transport has to have, underline that, has to have an energy source. That energy source might be ATP, it might be something else, but it has to have an energy source to do active transport. What's the purpose of this pump? Well, this pump has a couple of purposes, but the primary purpose that this pump has is screwing with the osmotic pressure of the cell. Screwing is a very technical term, yes. Okay. It's screwing with the osmotic pressure of the cell. I said if cells don't screw with the osmotic pressure, what's going to happen? Poof, they burst. All right? By creating this artificial, unusual gradient of sodium and potassium, water is much less inclined to move across the lipid bilayer. This is a constant battle for cells. This is why they have to be almost constantly be burning energy to maintain that unusual osmotic pressure so that they don't burst from water filling them up. That's one function of this membrane, uh, of this, of this uh, active transport system. This protein has a name. It's called the sodium potassium ATPase. Sodium potassium ATPase. All right? It's called an ATPase because it's burning ATP. That's what, that's what an ATPase does. Sodium potassium ATPase. This pump turns out to have another very useful byproduct as a result of its action. OK? Well, actually, before I, before I tell you about that, let me, let me just ask if there's any questions about this. You guys aren't very questioning. Yes, back there. A very brave soul. Plant cells uh, do this also, yeah. And plant cells have very different kinds of considerations. So, so yes, uh, but, but plant cells will also do this, yes. Yep. 
But, but again, plant cells have a very different environment in which they exist. Yeah. OK? All right. A um, couple things about this. I, I, I'll give you some more nomenclature. I figure like you haven't had enough nomenclature already, right? OK? So uh, when we have something that moves uh, uh, ions across a, uh, uh, a, um, a lipid bilayer like you see here, we have some names associated with that. Okay? One is that if we change the charge as a result of what we're doing, we say that the process is electrogenic. Electrogenic. Genic meaning genesis, creation of. Electro meaning charge. Every time this guy functions, that is, every time it goes around one turn of this cycle, we're seeing three sodiums out, two potassiums in. That means we're increasing the concentration of positive charges outside. This is an electrogenic process. If, on the other hand, we were to put two potassiums out, I'm sorry, let's say three sodiums out and two potassiums in, three sodiums out and three potassiums in, we would say it's electroneutral because there's no net change in charge. Okay. We also describe this transport system with another term. Okay. And this term is called an antiport, A-N-T-I-P-O-R-T. An antiport is something that moves molecules in opposite directions. This is an antiport because it's moving the sodium out and the potassium in. If it were moving both of them in the same direction, we would call it a symport. S Y M, as in Mike, P O R T. And some books call that synport, S Y N, as in Nancy, P O R T. They're both equivalent. Sim or synport. So symport means that both things are going the same direction. Antiport means they're going in opposite directions. OK, so those are some terms that I think that you should know. All righty. Well, I told you that we needed to have an energy source to move things across the membrane. You've seen one energy source, and that one energy source was ATP. ATP is not the only energy source for active transport. There are other possible sources. What you see on the screen here is something that has nothing to do with ATP, but it's an active transport system. I need to explain to you what's going on with this. Okay? This is using a gradient to make something happen. The gradient itself is the energy source. Okay. What's the gradient? The gradient turns out to be these protons. As we will see, cells pump protons within themselves, and in some cases, outside of themselves. Bacteria, in particular, will pump protons outside of themselves. Well, if they pump protons outside themselves, that means there's going to be a higher concentration of protons on the outside than there is on the inside, right? That's a gradient. High concentration of protons on the outside. Those protons want to come in. And it turns out they will come in if given the opportunity. This is a little different than the glucose transport. The glucose, it was simply a concentration gradient. Glucose came floating in, right? We have a concentration gradient here, but protons will not come in in this transport system unless they carry with it lactose. Lactose is known as milk sugar. We'll talk about it later in the term. It's an energy source for bacteria. It's an energy source for bacteria. It turns out that lactose is higher concentration inside the cell than outside the cell, which means lactose is being moved against a concentration gradient. The cell is gorging itself on lactose. Okay? 
So by virtue of the fact that lactose is moving from a low concentration to a high concentration, this is an active transport system, and the energy source here is the proton gradient. Lactose couldn't be the energy because lactose is moving from a low to a high. It can only be the energy if it were moving from a high to a low. So it's moving against the concentration gradient, so that pumping the water up the hill. So lactose couldn't be the energy source any more than water could be the energy source getting it up the hill up here, right? Yes? OK, is so it still using ATP to pump the protons out of the membrane? It's possible, yes, but not required. So for example, there are bacteria that will pump protons in the presence of light energy. So the, the, the source of the protons doesn't really matter in the scheme of things, all right? but it does not have to be uh, ATP. Okay? So this is called a secondary transporter because something had to first create this gradient that brought, that made this thing happen. Is this a symport or an antiport? It's a SIM port. Good, OK. Is this an electrogenic transport or an electroneutral transport? So let's just follow the process going in. That's right. So going in, what kind of a process do we have? It's electrogenic because we have a positive charge and a zero charge on the lactose. Right. Good. Clear as mud? There's dirty water? Not clear at all. Yes? So how is the lactose going in if the concentration is higher inside the cell? Because the concentration is higher for the, for the protons out here. The protons want in. So the energy source is the protons coming in, that gradient of the protons coming in. Because the transporter is, is basically putting these two guys together, the protons and the lactose, and they come in together. So it's not just a straight digital line that's It's definitely a transport protein. Yeah, all these are transport proteins. But it's not just like a pore. That's just it's not just a pore. No, it's, it's, a very specific, it's a very specific system. That's right. And it's simplified here, as you can imagine, but, but yes. But it's the, actually the, the, the higher concentration of protons that's bringing that lactose in. So imagine, if you will, that, just, just a second. So imagine, if you will, that I pumped that water up the hill, okay, and then I had some toothpicks that I wanted to get back down here. I pumped the water up the hill, the water interacts with the toothpicks, and the water flows back down and brings the toothpicks with it, right? So that's what this is. There are the toothpicks right there. And there's the water. So the protons want the water to the lactose. Shh, shh, shh. If what? If the protons want the water to move the lactose. Very good. So if, if, the, the, if there were not an energy source and this were not moving against a concentration gradient, it would be facilitated diffusion. That's correct. Question back here. Is it electrogenic if it's changing the charge of the cell itself? Yes, that's correct, it is. OK? OK, I like to do a song every time. And so I don't have a song about transport proteins, all right? This is one of the few things I don't have songs about. But I do have a song about the weather that I think is appropriate. So you guys, you guys know um, the old song, Let It Snow, Christmas song? All right, well, I've got a better one. Thank you.
Thank you.